Accessing library computer data. And to make sure history never forgets the name Enterprise. Hey everybody, welcome to the Penske Podcast. If you haven't tuned in before, this is a podcast where we are running through all 178 episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, giving our thoughts and feelings about each and every one. Right now we're up to episode 18 of season 5. This one is called Cause and Effect. It was directed by Jonathan Frakes, written by Brandon Braga. It aired back on March 23, 1992. In this one, the Enterprise is caught in a time loop, which results in the destruction of the ship and the loss of all hands after a collision with the USS Bozeman. Clay is here to talk about this one. It's cause and effect. It's one of my favorites. It's considered to be one of the better episodes of TNG. Me and Clay are going to break down what makes it so great and all that stuff. So, guys, thank you very much. And right after this break, me and Clay are going to be back and discussing cause and effect. Damage report. Casualty reports coming in from all over the ship. The starboard nacelle has sustained a direct impact. We are venting drive plasma. Initiating emergency core shutdown. Inertial damper is failing. We're losing attitude control. This is the bridge. All hands to emergency escape pods. Core shutdown is unsuccessful. We are losing antimatter containment. We've got to eject the core. Ejection systems offline. Core breach is imminent. All hands abandon ship. Repeat. All hands abandon. Well, I, we've been building up this one for long enough. This is cause and effect is one of my very favorite Star Trek episodes. I might have uh, ruined the suspense for everyone, but I, I really love this episode. I've been talking about it in previous episodes, waiting for it. Um, this is one of those shows that I can always rewatch, which I think is even more a testament to it because of the nature of the episode. Um, that this is rewatchable at all is kind mm. of amazing. Um, Cause and effect, it's the one where the, the Enterprise blows up and keeps repeating. I'll start off by saying it is the singular best cold open the show oh, will ever absolutely. do. Yo, at where where the previous episode has the worst cold open. Yeah, they were this, saving it for this one. Yeah, this very easily has the best cold open. The best uh the best disaster scene I think that they filmed. I think it's just a it's a it's such a beautiful little concept, and it's like a, an amazing use of the five-act structure of a TV show, uh, mm-hmm. where you basically repeat it five times over with slight differences. Um, I don't know. I think that the, the, it also did a thing where me and Amy were watching it, and like halfway through, she just looked over. She's like, "She's like, this is this is the best kind of Star Trek story." Um, mm. You know, oh, yeah, I, I think that I tend to agree. Like, I, I can appreciate the character work. And the character stories, you need them in a show that's going to do 200 episodes. The show is not really the best design for character work, uh, just because of the serial or non-serialized nature of it and everything like that. Mm-hmm. It, what it does excel is, uh, and it was Amy's point, you know, the show is set in space for a reason. Like, you can use the mystery of the unknown of space in a way yeah. to tell stories that you can't do in other shows. Definitely, yeah. And I think that that's really why this one just excels at it. So what did you think of Cause and Effect? I thought it was terrible. <laughs> Five times over. No, this is probably, I mean, even before I had gone back and watched most of the series. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I had watched TNG when I was a kid, uh, but I had never watched the lion's share of the episodes because they're on, you know, WLVI 56 at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So yes. you catch like one. Yep, yep. When you remember it's on. Uh, so a couple years ago I went back and I, I watched, you know, like the best. I think I watched like the best and worst seven of each season or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Based on whatever. And even before that, when I think of Star Trek The Next Generation, this is the episode I think of. So I think I saw this when I was a kid. And this is the episode that made its impression. When yeah. I think about TNG, I think about the <laughs> Depress blowing up. <laughs> <laughs> it should blow up every single episode. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's it is such a memorable concept. Uh, it's something the show has never done before. It does it. It, it films it very well. Mm-hmm. The, I think that the the 
the ship, like the once the ship uh, encounters the other ship, that that whole scene, the amount of times that they shot it, is really one of the best, like actiony dramatic sh- scenes that they've ever done. Mm-hmm. Like it, it still holds up today, even really just in like Picard, Picard basically shrieking like all hands abandoned ship is such yeah. an iconic moment. Yeah, um, it's really really cool. It gives you a, a great understanding of like the worst case scenario for what would happen there. Um, staged very well. Like the the teaser doesn't even show you why this has happened. It skips right. that bit. It just shows right. you from from impact on. Um, and I think that this one is exceptionally strong writing by Brandon Braga, and mm-hmm. it's also Frakes did a pretty amazing job directing it. Yeah, I, honestly. So watching this episode again, I watched this not too long ago. Um, and it, which had been the first time in a while I'd seen it. So it was fairly fresh in my mind this time. And I actually, this is probably, you know, uh, blasphemy to say, but I actually found it not as interesting as I usually do. I don't know why. It was just like after the first loop back around, I was like, ah, oh, fuck, they got to go through this whole poker scene again. And, like, yep. I, and I don't know. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because I've seen it enough times or or what. But it's uh, the thing that actually got me really interested in it this time around was I didn't realize Frakes had directed it before. So when I saw his name up there, I, I was paying really close attention to you know shot selection and stuff, and he does a really good job. Every loop is basically shot differently. Yeah, which I thought was a really interesting choice because. You know, as I was watching it, like when they loop back around to the to the first po- to the poker scene again, it's like, wow, he's shooting this from a completely different angle. It's clearly a different take. Yep. I feel like the way that you would normally do this is you would just use the same footage, or you know, and then until it changes, and and so the change feels that much more jarring. Right. You'd splice in sort of edits about the change. This is the change that we're going to talk about this time and things like right. that. Right. Or, yeah. or at the very, if, if it's not, if it's not the same take, at least shoot it the same way. Right. But yeah, he shoots every time he wraps around to basically every scene, he shoots it differently with the exception yeah. being, I think the destruction scene, cause that probably costs a lot of money to do once, let alone five or six different setups for it. Sure. Sure. Um, because I, I did notice that every time that they show the ship coming out of the uh, 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 space-time continuum rip, it's the same shot. Because it's like, well, we have money to do this once. Yes, they uh, they do it. They do a. Um, the, I think there's one close-up. That effect is actually pretty good too. The like yeah. the light around the ship kind of. It, it was just a unique thing, but they do. Um, they show the, the, the and the ships colliding is always the same shot, obviously, because that probably right. that probably cost ten million dollars back then yeah. to film that <laughs> shot. Um, but yeah, I th- I thought it was v- uh, really interesting that he chose to do that. The the writing is also I, I agree with you that um I think that the first loop back, especially if you've seen this before, the first loop back is the the worst one because they really have to lay a lot of groundwork about what's happening here. Yes, you know, so they they the first the second repeat or the first loop back is very similar to the first time through uh, because they have to just kind of hint at what's changing. Right. They make they're allowed to make more drastic jumps later on. And what I what I enjoy about the writing in the last couple loops is that they alternate scenes where you you don't see Picard reading his book in the right. first run, but you see that instead in the second one. In the first one, you don't see Crusher break the glass. The second one, you do see it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I and think, then la- and then later on, you hear it over the communicator. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know you know what's happened and everything. And so they they mix it up a little bit as it goes on. I do agree. The first one is just. You have to you have to establish what's going on, and it's it's a little boring if you know what's going on. Yeah, I I felt like it really it it really came back to me, like I really got into it again um, when they started figuring stuff out, and when they started doing those changes of scenes and changes of approach and stuff. Uh, because that those it, you know it there's a couple things in it conceptually that I found really interesting, uh, which is. The first of which is that data is completely unaffected by it. Like he, at no point does he is he like, oh yeah, I have these phantom memories of X, Y, and Z, like everybody else does. Yeah, He's yeah, just basically reset. Yep. Um, and I loved that. You know, where they do this same kind of thing in a mo- in like Groundhog Day, where you see Bill Murray do the same thing, but then he goes 
off the rails and for that day may never come back to the rails. Right. Yep. This one has like almost like predestined points that they hit every time. Or yeah. it's like yep. you should, they have the same amount of tape to work with and it's all about well how do they get from point A to point B? They have to get to point B and they will get to point B every time, but not necessarily going the same way, but they always end up there. Right, which yeah. I, which yeah. I found really interesting. I thought that was very cool. Yes, yeah, uh, most you know, probably everyone mentions the you know, Crusher remembers breaking the glass, so she moves it to a different table and just breaks the glass in a different way on her yes. on her way out. It's it's that kind yeah. of a thing. Yeah, it's 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 nifty. Um, the would you say it's a Crusher episode? Yeah, and I love that. I love that it's a Crusher episode. Yeah. It, um, however, I will say. Again, complete, like, why is this not a Troy episode? Amy mentioned that, too. I think I disagree. Like, what do you think What do you think is lacking from Troy in this take? Well, I feel like she should be the person who's the most sensitive to this stuff. And the, they even go out of the way to have her be like, I sense nothing unusual. And it's like, well, that's literally all you're here to do is sense things that are unusual. So I feel like if they had made this her story or had her in the crusher role, it would have, I don't know, at least given her something to do. She doesn't do anything no, at she, all in this episode. She, she doesn't have much at all to do. Um, I, I think that my counter argument would be that they're in a, they're, the setup for the episode is that they're in a portion of space that's never been explored before. So they mm-hmm. don't know what's going on. I, I can understand there's nothing to me that screams Troy should be picking up that something's weird here because everyone is kind of confused. So she would be sensing everyone's confusion about things. Yeah. Um, I feel like she should be the one who's hearing the voices, though. I mean, if she's picking up like residual residual ghost voices, I feel like the person who should do that is probably Troy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the voices are have I could. I, I'd be. I think I'd be. I think I'm happy with the way it is. Except I. I could throw in a line where, or a scene maybe where she feels something. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. The story is that dependent on her doing it because the, what's actually happening to them is like, like the noises are actually happening. People are hearing the noises. Yeah. No. I mean, I don't think it's. De- I don't think it has to be Troy. Yeah. But yeah I yeah. think. It, I, I think it. It makes more initial sense for it to be Troy. I like that it's Crusher because I like Crusher a lot. Yep. Um, and she doesn't really get much to do. Um, she, gets so a, putting, she gets a bow in her hair in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she and goes, we get yeah. to see, we get to see uh, uh, Picard and his captain jammies. Yep, yep, yep. I guess, yeah. The, it's a, um, it's an episode that always brings up, uh, to me, the show is weird about when it's appropriate to contact people. Yeah. Like it, it's clearly late at night, and you you can just page people. Um, you know there there was an etiquette when people had landlines about you can't call after like ten o'clock at night or something. But right, it doesn't right. happen in the twenty fourth century. Yeah, it's um, I like the fact that uh, Crusher is the one who sort of figures this kind of stuff out. It's also I think useful or something to sort of consider. The episode never really does it uh, outside of mentioning that they've been in the the loop for seventeen days. You don't see what I would assume to be all the failed loops that have obviously right. happened. Right. Um, you know, you only see a couple, so it's hard to tell. I was almost of the mind that 17 days felt too short. I would have gone even longer than 17 days to be in the loop. Cause yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's. I think it's long enough where it, can, it feels like a long time, but not long enough to really, you know, be like be like you know Kelsey Grammer's ship where they've been <laughs> stuck, stuck there for 78 years or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, it's a good cameo by him. Um, yeah, this one I I remembered that he was in it, but when I saw his name at the credits, I was like, man, when does he? Oh my, yeah, he doesn't show up until the last thirty seconds of the episode. Yep, That's and they really weird. Uh, originally, Kirstie Alley was supposed to be the first officer on that ship because of the, oh, really? the Star Trek movies. Yeah, That's interesting. Didn't uh, didn't work out, but it's um, yeah. I just I think it's a really well executed, well written concept. Um, I like the. I like the way that they resolve it. it feels very Twilight Zoney, um, where yes. da- Data just is responsible for making threes appear all over the yep. ship. Um, mm-hmm. The the card reveal is great. He deals everyone a three, and then he gives a three of a kind to everybody. Yep. Um, it's a really good, you know, since you've seen that scene a couple times already, it's a really good subversion of it. So you know, it it keeps you off 
off. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it's su- it's surprising. Yeah, it keeps you, you on know. your toes about what, yes, this this, yeah. this loop is going to be different from the other ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like the fact that they have to blow up to send the message back. I mean, that makes sense, but it's kind of a it's just it's a, a great way to data furiously typing in the message on his pad before the thing blows up. Um, something I I think that always makes me laugh and is totally in the tone of TNG. <laughs> When they discover that they're stuck in a loop and it's the, destru- the destruction of the Enterprise that causes it, and they play the thing back, and mm-hmm. the playback is basically everyone going like, oh, fuck, I can't believe this. <laughs> I'm like, you know, Picard's screaming of abandoned ship, and they all just sit there very calmly as, yeah. as this is go- <laughs> as, as chaos is uh, approaching them. They handle it very, very well. So, as you know, I do have, this episode is great. I love it, but I do have some little problems with it uh similar to the the problems i had with um oh shit uh the one where they all lose their memories conundrum yeah i feel like the selection of what they remember and what they don't remember is kind of weird like they remember they can they go back to the poker thing and they can call out the, the hand that's being dealt but when they get to the point where the ship is going to smash into them, no one says, oh, wait, maybe let's not do the tractor beam this time. Or, you know, like, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, they, all, I sh- to be fair, they make no distinction about what sticks and what doesn't stick. But it's like they remember every they remember bits of everything before that final scene, but nothing about that final scene. I guess I'd explain it away by they don't have time to think about it. That's fair. It's kind of like um, I, I was thinking the same thing. Like Picard never goes like. Uh, maybe I won't ask for suggestions this time. How about someone just do something? Yeah. Um, I, I think I'd explain it away just because the impact is imminent. They don't have time to consider these type yeah. things. Yeah, I mean, I guess they do kind of cover it with Picard saying, you know, it's let's not start second-guessing ourselves right now kind of thing. Yeah, a- another example of they should have just listened to Worf because if they turned around, it would have oh, yeah. been fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the, the other thing I thought was kind of weird, and I obviously this is – you know, uh, um, fictional science that is kind of tough to really uh, um, be mad with. But <laughs> Dig into it. Uh, why does time keep passing outside of the causality loop? Yeah, that's a good question. And tying into that, what was the, what was the other ship doing in its loop before the Enterprise stumbled into it? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you, if if they were doing their loop for a long time, you'd think, figure that hitting the Enterprise would be the difference that would change things. Right. So, yeah, I mean, does that mean, well, I mean, technically, since, since hitting that ship is part of the causality loop, that means that it theoretically would be part of the causality loop for the other ship as well. Right. So, but th- they haven't been shooting around for 80 years that's true that's a good point like i Uh, I don't know what they've been doing in in their loop unless they've been repeating such a mundane moment in time (laughs) that they never noticed that anything is any different that's it's very possible that's what they were doing (laughs) it's just just like uh, yeah it's um i I enjoyed the concept that's my only real uh sort of time weird loop thing and i guess you know i guess you because I, I buy the fact whenever they mention that there's a warp bubble and th- things happen inside the warp bubble that are not happening outside. I was like, oh, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a stupid quibble to have. But because, you know, time travel and causality loops are not something that actually affect us in a day-to-day life. So who gives a shit? <laughs> That's but, true. Oh, but it is, it is, it is, you know, uh, trying to explain that science is... Uh, uh, Jordy, Jordy gives it the old college try. But <laughs> 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 yeah, they have a... Uh, Good, good conference scenes in this episode. I thought it's a, uh, it's the the right amount of interesting information that should be revealed in those scenes because those those can drag a little bit if as uh, they largely serve as just sort of catching people up on what's going on. Uh, here, the catching up is actually a, a huge part of the the plot that comes through. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess you know we make fun of it a lot, but we really have to thank the fact that Riker likes to basically mount the ops com as the only way that they're ever, ever able to get out of this situation. That's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's a couple. I was also laughing. Um, Riker falls down apparently during the explosion thing. I don't know why that happens because it looks awkward in every single shot. That oh, I, I don't even remember. Yeah, he 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 sort of jumps off to the side or something. 
um, the commentary track was making the joke about he has to direct, so he has to get out of out of the shot as quickly as oh, possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we were talking about the uh, the Enterprise is extremely flammable in this. Yes. Uh, yep. Those walls go up like they're just you know dry kindling basically, and not a uh, computer station. Um, yeah, outside of that, it's you know it's. Uh, what'd you think of the the model explosion? The explosion of the model. Ah, uh, looked pretty good to me. Yeah, I think it's. I, I noticed in one take the other nacelle blew up. That was my <laughs> that was my only weird quibble. It's <laughs> like oh, they hit the right one and the left one blew up first. Because um, those models are very big, too. Yeah, I can imagine they must be. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, it, I, I, blowing it up would actually be kind of you need like blast doors and everything around it and like uh, cameras <laughs> behind some plexiglass. Yeah, it's cool. I don't know if there's a lot to talk about in this episode. Um, it's really just sort of a nifty novel concept that's very, uh, very yeah. They memorable. do it really well. And actually, one thing I did notice: um, there's no B plot, no, at all. And I think that really is a plus. Uh, I can't. I, <laughs> right. I mean, I can't even imagine. Uh, well, I don't know. I guess. To, I guess if you really wanted to break it down, maybe there is a B. No, I guess there isn't. I was just trying to think if maybe it was instead of a B plot, it's like well, an A plot that has like a B level to it, but there's really not. No, because I, I don't think. I mean, Crusher. I, I could. I could even see the argument that Crusher. This is not a Crusher story, so I'd, mm-hmm. I'd have a hard time giving her the A plot when everyone's plot is pretty much on equal footing here. Yeah, I think I think that's what it is. And I think we've talked about this before is that's that's when these episodes work really well is when everybody has something to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um when you get away from that, oh well this is a Riker episode or this is a Wharf episode and you just, you know, tell a story that involves all your characters and they do a really good job here. Yes. Yeah, it's a good uh, a good use of the ensemble. Everyone everyone has something to sort of throw in. Troy has a couple minor lines, but Crusher gets her thing, you know. Uh the poker scenes are always good for getting character beats across and everything like that. Mhm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's you- it's a um it's a interesting little little episode that I enjoy very very much. But uh yeah, I guess we'll go to final thoughts. There's not really much else to talk about with this one. It's very simple but very good. So, I'm going to play an audio clip uh, it might be the exact same one as the first one in this episode. Who knows? I'll figure that I think, out. I think you should just start the whole podcast over yeah. and just play the whole thing again. <laughs> and then let's, I'll do 17 days of uh, podcasts oh, of this man. podcast. Oh, we, man. We really blew it. If we had put some more time into this, we could have made a really interesting episode of podcast. I, uh, where if, if, you, if we had done our whole podcast and then we go back and pick different points at which we realized <laughs> that we, – so we play it again – but at a certain point, we realize that we've already said this stuff, and we, anyway, this, this, this there was a, there's a whole two hour audio, uh, audio theater production we could have done around this, but we, you know, we don't I, have that kind of time. I always have the uh, hopes to do a podcast that matches the theme. The theme. I might do it for the finale because I have an idea about how that would actually work. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and this one would have been a very easy one to do too, or at least it would have taken a lot of time. It might not have been easy to do, but it would have uh, the concept would have worked. But yeah, maybe for the finale I'll do that because, yeah, who's who, no, ain't no one got time for that, as, as they say <laughs> in the internet. But yeah, so guys, uh, I'm gonna play an audio clip. Maybe it'll be the same one. Maybe it won't. Me and Clay will come back with our final thoughts for cause and effect. Damage report. Casualty reports coming in from all over the ship. The starboard nacelle has sustained a direct impact. We are venting drive plasma. Initiating emergency core shutdown. Inertial damper is failing. We're losing attitude control. This is the bridge. All hands to emergency escape pods. Core shutdown is unsuccessful. We are losing antimatter containment. We've got to eject the core. Ejection systems offline. Core breach is imminent. All hands abandon ship. Repeat. All hands abandon. I loves me a good sci-fi episode of Star Trek. And that's pretty much what cause and effect is. So uh, any surprises here? I'm going to give this one a five out of five. It's one of my, it's certainly a top, top five episode, I think, in my opinion, once this is all said and done. I, I, I find it uh, sort of, maybe not remarkable, but I find it very remarkable for TNG. Um, it's such a cool use of the act structure in a television narrative. Um the writing and direction is different enough each time that it keeps you interested in how it's going to go down. And I think the solution is 
a really elegant solution to how they solve the problem at the end of it. So, Clay, what'd you think? Uh, yeah, I'm the same. I give it a five. Yeah. Um, is this wasn't the first episode that Frakes directed, was it? No, I think okay. it's maybe his third. But at this point, still, I'm surprised that they gave him such a uh, uh, complicated one. Yes. I mean, I mean, yeah. I, maybe you could argue that it's not that complicated at all, but um, especially judging. <laughs> Not not that this needs to happen, but judging the way that he directs an episode versus the way that Patrick Stewart directed an episode. <laughs> right, yeah. Because in, in Stewart's episode, I remember pointing out how poorly he used the push-in yeah, on yep. that story Jordy was telling. But Frakes uses it masterfully in this episode. He really like, does. Yeah, the, uh, the conference room, he uses it a ton. He, he switches whatever loop they're in. He pushes in on a different character. Yeah. Which is really cool. And uh, he also he does those weird close ups in the poker thing when they've realized for the first time it's really jarring. Yep, yep. <laughs> and um, he he does this really cool shot uh, like the third or fourth time that uh, Jordy's getting his eyes checked, where he starts at Jordy's eyes, and then he tilts the camera up yep. and, and moves it down so yep. the camera ends up down by his feet looking up at him as yep. they come to the realization it was very cool it, and even uh there's a later crusher scene uh i think it's the maybe the last one where she's in her room where she's really starting to freak out and he actually goes to like a handheld thing yeah, yeah which was which was i don't think i've ever seen that on the show before maybe i have i don't know yeah but, the the other one that sticks out to me is um the one where jordy uh the one where you talk about where it sort of it sort of tilts down and is looking up at jordy they also mm-hmm. shoot uh, Picard. He walks in and he's in sick bay, and they shoot from that very low angle, looking up, mm-hmm. um, which I think cinematically is always supposed to imply sort of dread, like it's kind yeah. of an unsettling shot to be looking up at people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think he does a, a pretty remarkable job. The commentary was interesting too. It's something you don't really think about, but you know, TV and editing now is all done digitally. This is pre-digital editing. Oh yeah. So that right. would have been extremely tedious to have to track all of the footage. You know what I mean? Mm. Because you, I can imagine the editor sitting back going like, "Wait a minute, which one? Which one is this supposed to be a part of? Like, oh, what, yeah, what take yeah. is this?" Because um, you know the script is obviously the same. It's just the minor differences. But yeah. Hopefully they had some sort of like categorization system for that. <laughs> yeah. You, you just you shoot everything from. I wonder how they shot it. Do you, do you think? Well. They must shoot all the different scenes as the actors are on the same set, right? Yeah, they must do it that way, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's interesting. And if anything, that's a uh, credit to the acting of it, mm, that they played yeah. it differently enough. Well, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I think that's, I mean, yes, obviously it is. But it's it's it seems like the, the best way to do that. Because then you've got, I mean, you can break your, especially if you've, like you're saying, it's a five-act structure. So you're basically doing it five times. And you can break down each section into which version it is. So it, it you know, it seems like the uh, the way to do it that makes the most sense because you can adjust accordingly. Yep. Without you know having, it's not like you're leaving that set and coming back and having right. to rethink. You know, and the actors don't remember what they did last time. Like it's very you're you're in the moment of remembering how you're going to change these things. I suppose. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a hell of an episode. I think it's one of the strongest uh, ones the show ever did. Pure sci-fi uh, makes sense with all the characters. It's that good sci-fi where the characters actually make sense uh, inside of it. It's not like um, what was that terrible Jordy episode, uh, Identity Crisis, oh, where, yeah. which was sci-fi without, which is also a Brandon Braga episode, but uh, not as good as this one. Anyway, uh, thanks hits and misses. Hits and misses. Swing and a miss. Guys, thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed the content, you're on YouTube. Like in the comments. Appreciate it. If you're on iTunes, a rating and review helps get the show out there. We've had a lot of great comments uh, recently on YouTube. Uh, I'll probably call a section and read them out next time. But, yeah, guys. I mean, I assume are they, are they just more about me? They are. They're like, where's Clay? Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if Clay's that the episode. That makes sense. We're, I'm not, listen, I know that you're probably thinking that, well, oh, I mean, it's really easy to get multiple email addresses and then sign up for YouTube and <laughs> lots of comments about yourself. <laughs> but that's not what I'm doing anymore. YouTube needs to, uh, yeah, to put some kind of pay limitation on that. Do better tracking, YouTube. Or, yeah, I just I get my views by just re-clicking refresh on the uh, thing to make it <laughs> pop up again. But no, Does that actually work? Uh, what do you mean? If you Does, like, if you reload it, is it a new view? Even though it's just same computer reloading it every time. Yeah, I think so. I oh, think it for does. some reason, I thought it was like 
I don't know, IP address based or something. I think YouTube has systems in the way to prevent people from roboticizing that to get ad views. Mm-hmm. So I think I think they would care eventually at some point, but just refreshing it'll just give you the same view or whatever. Well, I guess I'll be spending the rest of my day bumping <laughs> up the views on some videos that I have out there. If you want to make a nickel a day, just re- hammer that refresh button. It's a good way to go about it. <laughs> I think that's that's worth my time. I think. Yeah, probably. I mean, it, it cost benefit it doesn't cost anything to do. Get a nickel out of it. There you go, guys. Thanks very much. Cause and effect. One of the finest. What the hell is after this one? I cannot remember. I don't think it really matters. I won't look it up. But I'll be back in a couple of days with that. Clay, thank you very much for joining us. Anytime. Yeah. Although I should probably just, I mean, I don't know what's left to do at this point after this episode. So maybe I'll just, you know. Yeah, there's the, what, what's what's coming down the horizon? You'll have uh, you'll have inner lights probably if I'm looking at my schedule correctly. Uh, and then a couple more. Then uh, the one in the seventh season where they all turn into uh, pre-devolved animals, <laughs> which is a fantastic episode. Uh, that'll be it. That'll be I'll it. Just, I'm just gonna I'm gonna sign out and I'll be back for the series. Now, so. <laughs> Guys, see ya.